Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Cyber Tuesday. Uh, today, I'm joined with uh, our practice director of quality engineering, Tathleen Ramos, and she's going to talk us through uh, the, all the ins and outs of quality engineering. And yeah, thanks for joining the podcast, Tathleen. You're welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. All right, let's let's kick it off. First question: How did you get into quality engineering, testing the whole thing? Yeah, great question. So. My work in quality and testing didn't actually um, start right away. I actually, it was my dream when I was younger to be a systems analyst. So I was set an assignment in grade, in year nine while I was still at high school. Our teacher set it as an, as an, as an assignment where we had to look in the newspaper, um, either the Thursday age or the Saturday age, and go and find a job that appealed to us. And for whatever reason, the term systems analyst, the job of a systems analyst really stood out to me as being something that just sounded incredibly interesting. And my dad was a, a lecturer at Melbourne University my whole life. And so I went to my dad and I said, Dad, what does a systems analyst do? And he says, well, they work with computers and they sit with customers or, or end users and they try and understand what the customer's need is. And then they take that customer requirement and they translate it into something that a developer could build and that a tester could test and that you can release as a software system. And I thought, wow, like working with computers every day and working with people and, and their requirements and trying to understand what they need just sounded amazing to me. So I set my goal of doing um, being a developer, becoming a developer one day. An analyst programmer was, was eventually the, the dream that I had um, beyond systems analyst. And I went to university. I studied a Bachelor of Computer Systems Engineering at La Trobe. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. And But when I got into industry, I found for me, development felt a little limiting because what I found is once I got to industry, I wasn't necessarily sitting with the customer. I wasn't necessarily being able to interpret their requirements. I was given a requirement and I had to write the code for it, which for me, it just, it was, it was very limiting. It wasn't the dream I had when I started out. So I worked as a developer for three years um, in VB6, which was the language of the day. I'd been trained in C and C++, um, but there was an opportunity to go back uh, to university and do my PhD at La Trobe. And so I decided to do that because I, I didn't know what else I should do with my life at that point. Um, my original dream wasn't quite what I expected. Um, and so I got a scholarship to go back to La Trobe and I did my um, PhD in software testing and I taught at the university part-time as well. And what I realized is actually what I really enjoyed was quality and testing. I did my undergraduate um, honors thesis on mutation testing with Associate Professor Carl Reed at La Trobe University. I did my PhD on really how to structure black box testing techniques in a way that makes them easier to learn, easier to use, easier to automate. Uh, and uh, yeah, that was also with um, Professor, Associate Professor Carl Reed. And when I was almost through the other end of that, I ended up taking a job as a developer again for just three months, mm -hmm. remembered why I found development so limiting. And then I was really, really pleased to have been then offered a, a role as a testing consultant at a, at a testing consultancy. I'd given a presentation um, and a paper at a conference and someone from my previous consultancy liked the presentation and I never looked back since. I found having a job with testing and quality gives me everything that I was looking for when I had that original dream. I get to talk with the customer. I get to understand their need. Um, I get to look at the requirements and say, are the requirements complete, consistent? Does it specify everything the customer was looking for? Then I get to work with the developers and help them understand the requirement better, how to, how to build it better, how to test it better. And of course, I get to work with the testing team to help guide them in how we can look at testing and how we can approach the testing from the best possible perspective. And I even get to work with the release team, the operations team, to look at how we release the system safely to production and monitor the system in production. So I get all of my dream that I had and more that I didn't even imagine I was going to enjoy. So that was my journey into testing and quality. <laughs> Oh, that, that's fantastic. It's, it's It's been a long journey. It's been a very interesting journey. You, yeah. You've seen so many things and you've worked as a software developer um, and you, you've seen the, the issues that customers are battling with, with getting the software up to spec so that they can use it within the business. Um, and, and quality engineering is a huge part of getting to that level, to that spec. So can you tell me a bit more about the history of quality engineering? Because you've been there 
almost mm-hmm. since the start well the last like say quarter of uh where it uh, started to really come into existence in and and get a, a noise within businesses as well yeah. so so how how did quality engineering come to be uh, the evolution of of the testing aspect of it as well Mm, definitely. Well, I really feel like the world of quality engineering has come full circle. It's written about now as though quality engineering is something new, but the amazing thing is that actually quality engineering's history stems really from the history of software engineering, because you can't do software engineering without quality engineering, and I'll explain why. So if you look right back, um, the concepts of quality control are not new. Really, testing is a form of quality control. Um, you know, people like Dr. Aman Fagenbaum and Deming and Schuhart wrote books in the 40s to the 60s on quality control and total quality management. Um, that's where concepts of testing really uh, emerged. But of course, humans have been doing testing for eons in different industries, at least in the software, from a software perspective, it was starting to emerge there. But really, the concept of software engineering itself emerged in the 60s. Um, Margaret Hamilton, who was one of the um, lead developers for the NASA program, coined the term software engineer to describe and software engineering to describe the work that they were doing at NASA. You know, she was trying to really, you know, embody the fact that when we are building a system, we aren't just coding. We're not just developing. We're not just writing code. We are engineering a, a piece of software, meaning To engineer really means to understand the customer's requirement first and foremost. What does the customer need? And to interpret that into a set of requirements and specifications that can be developed and built into a system. And in fact, in in every, every other area of engineering, the engineer doesn't actually build what they're building. So an engineer who's who's working on a bridge doesn't build the bridge. There's labor as you get in to build the bridge. If the if an engineer is working on a building the engineer themselves don't they don't put up the steel girders and they don't put the sides on the building they focus on have we understood the customer's requirement have we designed have we specified that requirement appropriately have we designed a safe reliable robust system and how do we test that system how do we measure it to make sure it that quality is present and what kind of tools and techniques and processes do we need to make that precise process and make it a repeatable process and a measurable process and an observable process. So the concept of software engineering has embedded in it the concept of quality engineering. You can't engineer software without thinking about, did I, did I construct the correct requirement in the first place? Did I build the right design? Did I build the right code? And did I test it right? And did I measure it right? All of those steps are verifying and validating quality all of that is built into software engineering because software engineering is all about delivering what the customer wants and measuring and making sure we have delivered what the customer needs software engineering emerged in the 60s uh we had books on software testing like the art of software testing emerging in the 90 in in, sorry the early uh, late 70s early 80s so the art of software testing was written in 1979 uh, we had the first standards on software testing built in 83 and 87. That was the IEEE 829 test documentation standard was written in 83. Originally in 87, we had the unit testing standard, IEEE 1008. And then we had the Quality Engineering Journal emerging in 89. So in the 70s, late 70s and the 80s and 90s, we saw the emergence of these um, textbooks on testing and journals on quality and quality engineering. Then um, in the late 90s and at the turn of the century, around the Y2K point, we had the emergence of um, standards on component testing, but also courses on software testing. So the original ISEB course, which was the predecessor of ISTQB Foundation, um, which was developed in, in England, that course was uh, developed and released in 1998. And when we had the emergence of the Y2K Y2K bug in 99 and 2000, um, we had a huge investment in testing. What we essentially Mm. saw before that point, we had a lot of developers doing testing. When I was a developer, we had to test our own code. We maybe had one person within the team that might do testing independently. Often they worked as a business analyst, which we still see in our industry today. But a job as a tester didn't really eventuate until um, the Y2K point when we needed so many testers 
that the profession of testing was really born. But what we saw at that point is that there was this divergence between the role of a tester and the role of testing and everything else in the life cycle. So we had separate roles for business analysts, separate roles for developers, even separate roles for architects and separate roles for testers. And what you saw, the benefit of that is that as testing being a profession, it's recognised that you need specialist training and specialist skill sets to perform the role of a tester. But the concept of engineering quality and testing kind of got separated. So after that point, um, then the first textbooks on quality engineering got written, uh, for example, in 2005, we had Jeff Tian write a textbook called Software Quality Engineering, which pretty much encompasses exactly what quality engineering is today, um, with a little less automation, but much of the contents that we see today. So the, the journey of software engineering and quality engineering are intrinsically linked. Um, I would argue that the journey of quality engineering started back in 66 when Margaret Hamilton defined the term software engineer and that quality is an intrinsic part of that. Um, and I think the only trouble we've had in our industry is where we separated the role of the tester um, to the point where people see testers as being their core line of defence against poor quality which is where at Planet we've tried to transform the industry. Instead of being testers, see us as quality engineers who can help you write the requirements better so you get the right requirements in the first place. We can help you design the code and design the system and architect the system better because we can question the completeness of what you've designed, question its robustness, question its um, security, performance, etc. We can question the code once it's written or the configuration once it's built. And of course, we can question the testing. We can, we can question the release processes. So we can provide that quality aspect to the full life cycle. That's where, anyway, that, that's where I see the history of quality engineering emerging, the separation of testing off, and now coming full circle back towards saying, actually, we need to engineer quality and not just test it at the end. Yeah, so, so that's, it's really all encompassing. It's from requirement to how well the software will perform, how secure it is, uh, hence the, the penetration testing that we do, the security assessments that we do on software. Um, I, I have to ask, from your perspective, over, overlooking the entire umbrella of everything quality in here, where do you see security fit in there? It's just out of my mm. personal interest. Absolutely. I, I'm really happy that you asked that, actually, Ferdinand. Um, so, you know, people talk a lot about DevSecOps as though security is the one thing you need to think about when you are thinking about the quality of a system and that security is the one focal point that you need to focus on when you're thinking about, mm -hmm. you know, the, the full quality life cycle. In fact, I would say what we need to do is focus on DevQualOps. Security is one core thing we have to get right. And I would argue it probably is the most important one, especially these days, if you are a bank, if you are an insurance company, and even if you are Roblox and you have built a platform for kids and some adults to play games on, security is of paramount importance. I mean, there's no point building a system that has customer data in it if it's not secure, because the second it's not secure, if that is observed by people and it's, and it's then reported on by the media, your brand will be potentially irreversibly damaged. And yep. um, in some cases, security incidents we know have totaled entire companies and brought them down uh, and caused businesses to fail. So I would argue security is actually the most important quality characteristic to get right. It's not the only quality characteristic to get right. So when we are building a system, Yes, we need to think about the functional requirements. What do we need? What kind of functions and features do we need to deliver to the customer? We equally need to think about what are the quality related requirements. You can call them non-functional requirements. You can call them quality characteristics, but they are the quality that glues together the system and keeps the customer coming back for more. Yeah, also with, with performance, um, I, I read an interesting article. It was published like years ago from Google. Uh, and they said if response times are so many milliseconds longer, people will leave the page. So if you click on a link and it doesn't start loading within like half a second, that means people click back and take the second result on Google. 
Um, and just the responsiveness alone will 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 win you business or lose you business if it's not done right. Um, also, when it comes down to security, especially with with all the threats that are out there, it, it's not if it's when. That that's a really big thing, and you will see laws all over the world. So Europe with their GDPR. Uh, in Australia, you've got huge fines for leaking personal information now that went from two and a half million, I think, to $50 million. Uh, also, those are incredible. Um, and also in the UK, I know that there has been changes to who, how, how accountability is handled with that. So if you screw up by not having your system secured and not doing your, per, your due diligence, um, you can actually almost go to jail there, uh, I believe. Mm, um, absolutely. So, yeah. I- yeah. And it just is is a whatever is a threat to your business, not only the business requirements. It's almost uh, always also the customer requirements around that, and that's where quality engineering also ties that in. Because a lot of organizations now uh, they're not the classic organizations we saw in the eighties and the nineties, where online that was a nice new fad. Now everybody is online. Everything's digital. Everything is computerized. Um, and everybody inter- interact. I mean, if you go to your energy company and you want to change something, you log into your portal. You change it there yourself. Mm, so you're you're poking and prodding and interacting with the systems that are behind that. So that's completely different than how it used to be. And I do feel that there are still some dinosaurs in the industry that think, oh yeah, well they just call the service desk and we do we take care uh, of it for them from there. Yes, you can still do that, but it's not the main the main path anymore. So that must be very challenging. And does that affect quality engineering and how you approach things nowadays? Is is there an evolution of quality engineering happening at the moment? Absolutely, Fernand. I couldn't agree more with what you've said. Um, if you have a look at Amazon, for example, there's been estimates that for every minute of downtime Amazon has on an Amazon Prime shopping day, they lose a million dollars in revenue. And that's something in like one minute. S- in one minute. Wow. That is something like sixty-six thousand dollars per second that they are losing. Now you think about it, like the average company, if they were losing sixty-six thousand dollars a second, they would <laughs> they would be out of business really quickly. Um, Amazon is a very large company. Uh, they have a very large customer base, and so they have a very trusted brand. When they have an outage, people are usually going to wait. If they've got their item in their shopping basket, they'll come back later to put that purchase through. Yet Amazon will not want to lose a million dollars a minute. (laughs) That even with such a big company and such a great brand, they won't want to lose that kind of income. So really, uh, when it comes to it, understanding the business need and understanding the critical business scenarios and business events that your company is going to face so that we can specify that as a requirement understand how the system might fail and how it might impact our brand if it doesn't deliver that requirement successfully, then we can work backwards from that and figure out how to test it in order to make sure we deliver that level of quality that's needed. And a good way to look at this is that for a developer to read, let's say we've got a performance requirement that, yeah, we need the system to respond within half a second. It used to be the case when I was, you know, first, um, at university, people would wait eight seconds for a website yeah. or a page to load. Now, definitely, it's under a second, half a second, even even fractions of of a, of yeah. a second, and people are already starting to get impatient um, if the page doesn't respond. Understanding that customer requirement, how many seconds will the customer wait? How many customers are we going to have per second performing that transaction? Therefore, what kind of workload profile do we need to support in production to support that kind of usage in the production system? We find a lot of our customers struggle to articulate those requirements. Then sometimes not even sure how to figure out that requirement. Now, Amazon is going to be monitoring their services, their servers to an inch of their life. You know, they will be monitoring every single thing their servers do they will be able to tell you what kind of workload profile they need to support on any given day of the year or any minute of of any day of the year because they'll have invested a lot in production monitoring and and analysing those behaviours of their customers. Not every company necessarily has made or can afford that kind of investment. So, And for a developer to try and um, 
understand how to build a well-performing system without requirements that tell them what good performance looks like, they're going to struggle. In fact, even for a company who's purchasing a commercial off-the-shelf system, such as a platform as a service or software as a service system, they won't necessarily even know which product to choose because they won't necessarily have the performance requirement or the security requirement that they can give to that you know, vendor and say, I need a system that will achieve these requirements. Will your system achieve that for me? Where quality engineers can help is we can actually do the performance monitoring in the live production environment for the customer. Or, and or we can use our past experience with similar systems to help the customer build an understanding of what kind of performance their system needs to support. Then, even if we don't know any of their requirements, we can at least go and sit down and use performance testing tools to put forward certain scenarios that represent potential production usage to see how the software will hold out. And we can run different scenarios to look at the breakpoints. How far can we push the system in terms of yeah. concurrent users and concurrent transactions before it will start to break? And once it starts to break, does it does its behavior sort of degrade gracefully where, you know, you have a look at the Ticketep website. If you're going to buy oh, yeah. the latest, you know, concert tickets, it won't fail what it will do is it'll tell you if there's too many users on the system that you can't log in right now because it's too busy processing other requests. Now, what I've also noticed about the Ticket Tech website is it will stop sending as much response data to the client machine. So on your browser, maybe you'll see fewer images showing up on your browser. The screen will look a little simpler, but it will still function it will still function. It will still tell you, sorry, you can't log in right now. Please try again soon. It's like, it's like turning the air conditioning off before you want to overtake somebody. Yeah, yeah exactly. And yeah. maybe instead of the power going out on our entire suburb, yeah. you know, maybe we'll all just turn our air conditioners down a little bit and, yeah. you know, so that we can all still experience air conditioning without losing the system altogether. So it's that graceful reduction in service without a full failure. And we can test mm. out test systems very, very easily to figure out very quickly. We can very quickly get an understanding of how likely it is that system's going to fail under certain scenarios. Now, of course, to do the big picture full testing, sometimes it takes longer, but sometimes we can get very early warning signs from a system very early on. Um, even in testing the APIs um, between two systems, um, testing the early prototype of a system to tell you what kind of behaviour you're likely going to get from it from a security perspective, performance, usability, accessibility. And there's lots of early testing we can do right back at the requirements phase where we can tell you, are your requirements testable? If your requirements are not testable without making an assumption, they're probably not buildable, buildable and developable without making an assumption. Anywhere we have to make an assumption, we might be diverting from the customer's true requirement. Yeah. So essentially, there's lots that a quality engineer can do across that full life cycle for all the different types of quality characteristics that matter to the customer. But what I find super interesting, what you just mentioned, is you can see with TicTech, a good example, they scale down how much they're pushing out. That is to preserve bandwidth and processing and everything just to keep the site alive. Um, but that profile is, is is very interesting how they got to that um, because they, they saw, okay, if we just keep on sending everything, then we have nothing. At a certain point, it will just come to a screeching halt. Now they say, okay, we'll have high load um, uh, measurements feeding into how the application actually works, which is an interesting move forward for that. So dynamically scaling it, you can only go so far with that without running up a huge bill. It's much easier to have your application sent less back, lower resolution video, whatever you want to do with that. Um, for security and performance, there's also an overlap there. Um, so I've seen systems break in a not so safe mode uh, where it just leaves stuff open. And with, if we do a pen test with a normal one user, one penetration tester poking and prodding a system, you will never get to the point where the system spectacularly breaks and spills its guts, so to speak. Um, and so it's, it's important to also have that crosstalk uh, when you're doing your quality engineering assessments that you have, okay, let, let's run this system at very high load and then do a pen test, see what we can see. 
or bring it to the to the verge of of breaking down and see if we can have the system create race conditions or security issues will might actually pop out of the, the woodwork that way um, and for high secure systems i would expect that would be part of the entire test plan mm. so um, also what i what, what you've uh, made me think is uh, in the past 20 years user experience have has gotten up and and in the back of my mind i just keep on hearing customer trust customer experience customer trust and if a system behaves well and it looks sleek and it's it's well designed from from that perspective um, that's also a quality aspect of things so user experience should actually fit in there as well how, how do you work with user experience uh, in quality engineering Mm, How yeah, do you look at that question? Yes, I'm gonna I'm gonna answer that question in two parts. Um, the mm. first is um, in relation to your, your your first point that you need to test in combination. Don't just do the security testing and the pen testing separate, and the performance testing separate, and the resiliency testing separate, and the functional some testing of it, separate. but not all. Yeah, some of it definitely. But at some point, bring those types of testing together. Put the system under load while you do a pen test. Put the system under load while you do a resiliency test. And while you're doing that, get some business users in to test the system and have a look at their perception of what the system is doing while collect it is metrics. under these. Yep. yep. Collect metrics, collect data from that end customer. Because what you want to know is, if is my system robust ultimately? And can it continue to deliver a high quality of customer service when it is under pressure? So if I've got the system under load, while I start pulling some plugs on some servers, while a business user is interacting with the system, then I can monitor in the background and have a look at how the system behaves from a technical perspective. But I can also look at how the system is going to be perceived from an end user perspective. When that end user is looking at that system, what is their perception? Ultimately, is that it is the customer's perception that matters the most. You yeah. know, we, we're engineers, we're developers, we're consultants. We can try and mimic that customer need, but ultimately you have to have the real customer in front of the system observing its behaviour themselves to know truly whether it's going to meet their requirements. So absolutely, test in combination. Test in isolation first up, but then test in combination. Now for your second point, that, that all comes down to the customer. Dr. Amand Fagenbaum, I really love his work. He was one of the people who did a lot of work with quality control and total quality management. Back in 1983, um, he wrote a book, um, actually, and I think it might have been published earlier even than, than 83. One of, and I, I have the book in my office. <laughs> so one of, one of his phrases, one of his phrases that I really love, his quotes, is that he said, customer, sorry, let me try again, quality is a customer's determination, not an engineer's determination, not a marketing determination, nor a general management determination. Now, you could probably add to that, it's also not ultimately a tester's determination or a project manager's determination or a product owner's determination because quality is judged by the customer's actual experience with the product or service based on their own personal requirements. Whether those requirements are, you know, technical or, or merely sensed, you know, perhaps we documented them, perhaps they were difficult to document and they always represent a moving target in a competitive market, meaning customer requirements are difficult to specify sometimes. You know good quality when you see it. You pick up an app or a product off the shelf, you know, whether it's on your computer or otherwise, you know when it feels good to use a good quality system. How can you tangibly describe that? Well, it's just the colours were really nice and it was, it was seamless. It was a good, consistent experience I could read it well without my glasses on or um, it was fast, it was safe, it was secure, it was robust. But how do I phrase that in a way that I can build that requirement and test that requirement? It can be really difficult knowing how to specify that customer need. Also, customer needs change over time. So when Dr. Aman Fagenbaum wrote that quote back in 1983, a good quality system was a green screen application probably running off a mainframe or perhaps only standalone on your desktop. You know, quality was how quickly can I tab through the interface? 
Can I use the function keys as shortcut keys? Uh, is it secure? Well, it probably was secure because not many people had access to it. It was very fast. It was very functional. But if you put it in front of the average teenager these days, they'd probably laugh and go, you want me to use this? Like, come on, you know, where's my app? Where's my nice level of user interface and, and customization even to my to my UI? So I think, you know, and even when you think about mobile phone apps and web apps, you think about our level of quality that we expected 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when the first, you know, iPhones were invented, if it was about 50, I think it was about 15 years ago. Compare that now to what you would expect in, in your average iPhone or, or Android app. Our expectations of quality change over time. And our expectations of quality are kind of <laughs> increasing exponentially. Yeah. So <clears throat> I do think that ultimately you need customers as part of the process. You need people who can work with the customer to understand their need. Uh, you can you need people who can question whether we've actually built what the customer asked for, um, but ultimately you need to incorporate the customer in the process, um, and the end always be focused. The, yeah, yeah, on on what that end user wants exactly. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Uh, it's super interesting because I've, I've heard someone else say that NFRs are kind of unspecified expectations most of the, most of the time. It makes it super hard to define those, mm -hmm. and it's something you highlighted here. Um, where where do you see this all heading now? Because it's 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 mature. I mean, QE is mature, and it keeps on moving forward. But I still feel that certain parts are in the rotary phone era. Mm. And if you show a rotary phone to a kid nowadays, you're going to see something funny. Call your call your call, call grandmother uh, with this, and it's like what? Um, so how do you see that evolving to the iPhone stages? Is there some evolution happening? Mm. <clears throat> I do. Where would think... you like to go with that? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. That's a great question. I believe we're going to be more and more dependent on our devices. So I can envisage a world where my watch and my earbud and my phone all talk to each other so often that as a human, you know, I almost don't need to look at the screen anymore because my phone is talking me through it through my earpiece. Yeah. Um, or the UI is so simple it has broken down the complex concepts so well that I don't even really need to look hard at the phone to know what I need to do. I think one of the key challenges in engineering is hiding the detail. So most offices nowadays have a coffee machine, for example, and those coffee machines range from really simple to really complex. And in the really fancy case, you know, I need to stand there brewing the milk and pressing buttons and which button do I need to press again? Like where I know there's a button somewhere here that allows me to have hot water and then milk and which, where do I do that? How do I find that button? What you find in really sophisticated workplaces nowadays is one tap with an iPad sitting next to it. And all you need to do is press one button on the iPad of, I want this and this and everything comes out from the one tap and it's all very simple and it's all very seamless. Probably what's happening under the desk is there's a very complicated coffee machine sitting under that desk. You just can't see it. And I think customers more and more want that level of service. They want you to make the UI so simple that it is quick, it's easy, it's serving all my needs. And you just go ahead and hide all that complexity for me because I don't really care about the complexity. I don't really care how you built it. I just want to be able to use it really quickly, get my job done and go home. So I think customers are going to want more, not less. They're going to want more performance, more security, more usability. They want their customers with disabilities supported. So we need more accessibility. We need more quality, essentially, built into the system. And I want you to make it look easy. And I want you to make it seamless. My experience, the simpler it is for the end user, the more effort has gone into engineering that product. And I do think also for our industry, customers are understanding from a consulting perspective, customers are understanding that they do need to build high performing systems. They do need to build secure systems. They do need to build robust systems. They know what they want. They just don't necessarily always know how to achieve it. And I think our job 
and what we're going to see more and more is needing to articulate what we do in words that a customer can understand. And so I think the onus is on us to simplify the solution for our customers. And I think then the onus is on all of us to simplify the product from an end user perspective so that you've got all of that, you know, complex coffee making (laughs) machinery sitting under the hood, but all I got to do is get in and drive the car. You know, I don't need to worry about how the engine works. Don't need to worry about how, you know, I just put the petrol in it and drive it. And there's the key. That's how it works. That's that's enough. Of, that's all I need to know. And I think that is it. what customers yeah. need. I need to know how to recharge it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But I don't want to know how it works. Don't bother me with that kind you of complexity. You don't need to. Yeah. yeah. Don't need to know. And so I think that, um, I also think that AI will be more and more an intrinsic part of what we are working with as an industry. Um, I think that now, now that with ChatGPT exploding on the market, uh, people can see from an end user perspective, they can see what AI can do and how it can help them. And I think a lot of customers are going to want more of that. And the challenge for our industry is bringing everybody up to speed with how to build a good quality engineer, a good quality AI system. How do we get the requirements right? How do we get the design right? How do we get the data right when we're training an AI system? How do we get the data right when we're testing the system? And how do we make sure the system is behaving itself in production? And that's the the last thing I think that as an industry we're going to see more of. The observability of the system is becoming more and more important. Mm. If I am going to monitor, monitor the security of my system in production, I've got to have touch points in that system that I can observe to know if it's secure. If I want to observe the performance of my system in production, I need touch points that I can grab a hold of to observe the performance of the system. And that that's the same for any area of um, quality. I need touch points in the system where I can observe, whether it is an automated touch point where I'm monitoring the system automatically or it's a point of customer feedback. So I invite yeah. the customer to tell me about their experience or I monitor how long it takes for a customer to complete a task so that I can check in and say, hey, did that meet your expectations? So I think of the observability and writing the requirements, again, writing the requirements for observability, mm. designing observability in, building it in and testing for observability are going to be more important moving forward. Yeah, yeah definitely. And from the security privacy aspects, you're talking about telemetry here when, when it's end user uh, or, or client, uh, clients accessing a web shop. Um, they can see where you're looking. They can see how you're navigating through. Uh, they can see how long it takes you to understand where to fill in your credit card number and your address and everything. Um, all that data needs to be collected, but also treated in a secure manner. Um, and there's a lot of trust issues with that stuff right now. Uh, you can see a lot of a lot of a um, lot of browsers uh, that have plugins installed to block that kind of telemetry collection. And I I, I do. I do understand why uh, people are a bit wary of that, um, but how can you make the the, the 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 quality of the system in such a way that you can do it without getting too much in the way of the privacy of people? Mm, uh, that is a question for the, for the future. Uh, with regards to where everything's moving, I heard you were also involved with uh, with an ISO project or IEEE project. What was it? Could you tell me a bit, <clears throat> bit more about that? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, so I'll, I'll look at the telemetry data issue first and security and privacy of that data. Now, if you think about it, for example, if you're using Google Maps like I do, I still mm-hmm. have a Melways, a street directory in the back of my car. I haven't yeah. opened it in a long time. And in fact, I think the last time I opened it was to show my kids. This is what we used to use, kids, as a map <laughs> to get from A to B. <laughs> Nowadays, even if I'm going somewhere that I know how to get to, I use Google Maps because it will tell me if there's a problem on the road and I'll know in advance, do I need to divert around that highway, divert around that road to avoid the incident so that I can get to where I'm going faster. Now, that data is being collected by Google and I hope, of course, everyone hopes that their data is secure. And, of course, for anyone who, you know, I mean, we have very sensitive situations. I don't really mind people know where I'm travelling Um, but there are situations where people's lives can be at risk because people know of their location. And so you're putting a lot of trust in the collection of that data. And, of course, Google would be collecting that data so that they can 
alert other motorists as to where the quickest pathway is to get from A to B. Uh, they'll be using it to improve the quality of their services and they'll, they'll certainly be doing everything they can to keep that data secure. <clears throat> Excuse me. But as you said, uh, it's not if but when. I do fear that um, ultimately it's, it, it is difficult to secure systems at times and it's not just a once-off, and you would know yeah. first, man, it's not a once-off thing. You have to continually monitor the security of your system. You need to regularly test your system from a security perspective. It's not a set and forget situation. Yeah. And so I think to 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 make sure customer data is secure, for me, it's looking at the life cycle of the product from a cradle to grave perspective, get the requirements right, design, code, test. But when we release it to production, have monitoring in place and continual repeated testing, get an expert in every three to six months at least to retest the security of your systems, you may have encountered a vulnerability that you didn't even know existed. You know, your security officer, your chief security officer is probably working very, very hard and your team of security people are probably working harder than most people in your organisation to keep your systems secure and there we know there are new hacks and new vulnerabilities detected every single day. And so I think the only way to really combat this is to have a continual mindset, continuous and continual. Yeah. And so it's a process. process. You mentioned Deming in, 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 a, a little bit back. Uh, so Deming is, is known for the Deming cycle. Plan, do, check, act. And that is, act. That, that is the core thing of your information security management. Yes. Um, you need to have continuous improvement. Uh, and it also goes for quality, should be continuous improvement. We're moving to distributed systems, a lot of small moving parts and components, uh, a, a lot, of lot of distribution of where the data actually lives. It's not like one centralized database anymore. Uh, it's everywhere now. It's, it's scattered about. And they all are micro services that are talking to each other and integrating with each other to deliver one unified end user experience. Um, and it's it's important to make sure that you you keep a right the, the right map out of what's actually out there, uh, what is exposing your customers, your business to any risks. Then on the other hand, and I totally agree with you, you need to keep on testing, you need to keep on monitoring. Um, you need to have like a security operations center in place for for, and it depends on your exposure, of course, uh, because the risk uh, sorry the the threat landscape is continuously changing. Um, last year it was uh, medical that was a target. Now it's a different industry, and it just keeps on moving around based on okay, the, the, the medical guys they've they've done their due diligence, they've done their hard work in, and they've secured more stuff of. So it's it's a harder target. Let's move on to a simpler one, yeah. and it keeps on going in circles that way. I feel, um, yeah, that that's that's my view on that. I couldn't agree more. And uh, that, that plan, do, check, act cycle, meaning a continual iterative process where yep. we continually plan, do, check, act, plan, do, check, act. Um, and I agree. It, the medical, medical industry was being targeted at a point in time. Different industries will be targeted at points in time. And I fear for, you know, innocent people whose data is stored in systems all around the world and that... Um, that data is not secure if, they, if the company who has built the system does not have that continual mindset and the companies that help customers implement systems, you know, the third-party vendors, the systems integrators, if they don't have that mindset that they need to teach their customer that it needs to be a continual process and that in your requirements you don't just specify what you want the system to do, you do a risk assessment to identify what the system could do if it's not meeting its requirement, what else could it do? How could it fail? Yeah. Why will it fail? How will that impact us? And how will that impact our customers? So we can work backwards from that and build a whole of life cycle strategy, you know, that cradle to grave strategy that wherever that system is, we're building quality in and we're determining whether quality is present on a continual basis and a regular basis throughout its full life cycle. Yeah. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. On your other question of ISO, yeah. um, yeah, so I was really fortunate enough, um, actually in my previous company, uh, my managing director at the time had gone to a conference in Europe and he'd spoken to 
a guy who was getting involved in international standards for um, software testing. And actually it was Dr. Stuart Reid who uh, works in, from the UK. He actually was the original, um, the person who wrote the original uh, British standard 7925, the component testing standard, and he designed the original um, ISEB software testing um, certification course that became the ISTQB training course. And he's intrinsically involved in ISTQB now. But um, my managing director at the time had had a conversation um, with Dr. Reed, and they ha he had mentioned, oh, we're going to start work on a new international standard for software testing. You should get involved. Uh, my managing director at the time didn't have the time to get involved. I was still in the process of finalising my thesis, um, very close to submission at the time. And, uh, yeah, my managing director said, I can't go to this international meeting um, and I'd like you to go. So I was very fortunate enough to have been in the right place at the right time. Uh, my managing director recognised that my um, PhD thesis was entirely related to the topic that was um, the subject of standardisation. And so uh, I went to the meeting. I uh, ended up, because I'm a fast typist, I took all the notes and the minutes for the meeting um, I helped design the original diagrams that formed part of the 29119 software testing standard that we have today. And when they said they needed people to help write it, there was a four-part standard covering concepts and vocabulary in part one, test process in part two, uh, part three being test documentation, and part four being test techniques, which was where my honours uh, my honors and my master's, the uh, sorry, PhD thesis were aimed. Um, and so when they said they needed editors to help write it, I put my hand up and said, hey, I'd, I'd love to get involved. I'd, you know, it sounds great. And I was one of the first, I was one of the four people that started the working group. And that was back in 2007. And I haven't looked back since. I now am chair of the Software and Systems Engineering Committee at Standards Australia, leading Australia's interests in not just software testing standards, but software engineering standards with ISO. Um, I recently got appointed as a project editor, a lead editor for a standard on quality engineering, which will include hardware software networks as well. Uh, I help write and maintain the software testing standard series 29119. I recently helped the IEEE um, update their um, IEEE 730 quality assurance standard, um, and I provided input to the um, IEEE 2675 DevOps standard. Mm. among others. So I'm, I really, I mean, I'm a firm believer that standards are a starting point. Now, some people in our industry mistakenly believe that standards are more like stencils where you can't go outside the lines and yeah. I have to stick with exactly what you've given me. In fact, ISO standards are entirely tailorable yeah. and they're a starting point. They set the bar at the bare minimum. This is the bare minimum you should all be doing in quality and testing. The bare minimum really being you should do a risk-based process where you understand how your system and your project might fail so you can work backwards from that and apply an approach to testing and quality that are going to mitigate those risks and covers the cover the customer's requirement. Of course, the reason we do that is because requirements are rarely complete. We can use risk assessments to really rapidly understand what other quality characteristics might matter and how to build that into the system. So I, I really thoroughly enjoy working with ISO. Um, I recently also, um, I'm a member of the joint working, uh, sorry, the joint working group between the Software and Systems Engineering Committee at ISO, yeah. SC7, Subcommittee 7, and the AI uh, Subcommittee, Subcommittee 42. So okay. I'm a member of the joint working group working on standards for testing AI systems. And I recently also joined the broader um, Subcommittee 43, the AI subcommittee, because I realised there are other standards related to the quality of AI systems that I need to get involved with. So the ISO 25010 product quality standard defines quality characteristics that matter, such as security, performance, usability, accessibility. Um, the, there's a corresponding AI standard, uh, 2259, which takes that quality characteristic standard and says this is how this is how it applies to AI and here's some extra quality characteristics that matter. Mm. When I looked at that standard, I see a lot of quality characteristics missing. So it's my mission to go and support subcommittee 42 in writing better standards for defining the quality of AI systems. 
I also see an opportunity to write a brand new standard on um, defining the quality of the data that's used to mm. train AI systems and that's used to test AI systems. So there is another ISO standard, um, 20, 20.0512, I think it is, which is a data quality standard, and there isn't a qual corresponding data quality standard for AI yet. It's my mission to help them write one. So, yeah, I really, I really think that um, standards can really help give people a starting point and a bare minimum that we should all be doing. They give us a common vocabulary, which helps us communicate more effectively. And it helps uplift the, the bar, you know, it sets the bar here so that, well, we, we all need to do at least this. And it sets the bar at a level that brings the industry up you know, to that level. Foundational. So, yeah. Foundational, foundational, as you would say. Yeah, exactly. And a starting point, uh, not a stencil, a starting point. Yeah. I fully agree. And I see a theme with, with most of the ISO standards that they're, they're, they're circ circling around, like, look, look at it from a risk perspective and, and do continuous improvement. Uh, and, and if you have that in place, then you can start off with the thinnest layer of that standard implemented. And it will improve automatically that way. And you will get better at it. And it will add more and more value the more it matures. And that's actually what you want. Because something matures, you want it to get better. Absolutely. It's not like, like wine, not like milk. Yeah. So. <laughs> exactly. No, exactly. Like a fine exactly. wine. Let's put it right. <laughs> exactly. You, you set the bar. It brings everyone up to at least a minimum level of quality. And then, then we can reach further than that. And I think that it helps mature the industry. Absolutely. And, um. Yeah, I'm, I really, I do think international standards play a great part in lifting that bar up to a, to a better minimum yep. level than we've, than we've otherwise got. Even if it's just raising awareness within an organization, what you're thinking, what it is, it's actually much wider. Because you looked at the AI standard that they're working on, and you said there's a lot of stuff missing here. And that's also because you've got your, your past 20, 30 years of experience in the field. And you started at Latrobe. And recently you have joined them again, but now from the other side of the classroom? Yes. What was the rumor I heard there? Yes. Yeah, so um, I was helping La Trobe last year, uh, myself and my colleagues, Kung Farm and uh, our, our colleague from our quality leadership group, um, Red Rivera and Juan Flores, all assisted La Trobe University last year by, um, they have third year student projects, third and final year student projects, where the students pull together everything they've learned and they have to do a capstone project where they build a real system for a real yeah. customer and they have to specify it, they have to design it, they have to develop and build it, they have to test it and they have to release it. And we worked with four different student groups um, with Dr. Scott Mann at La Trobe University as the supervisor and overseer of the subject and we helped set them a problem uh, and we helped oversee their work for the year by providing them feedback on how they were doing and giving them ideas on what else they could look at from a quality and, and testing perspective. And it was such an enjoyable process. And I stayed in touch with my colleagues from La Trobe. I still catch up with Associate Professor Carl Reed. In fact, he was just calling me before <laughs> and um, my PhD supervisor. And so I've stayed in contact with people from La Trobe. Um, and as it turns out, uh, Winnie Rahayu and Prakash uh, from the Department of Computer Soci Science um, at La Trobe University when he was one of my lecturers, Prakash was also working in the, in the department when I was doing my PhD. And they reached out and said, would you like to catch up for dinner? And I thought, yeah, it sounds great. Love to catch up. And um, they asked me first if I would chair their industry advisory committee, uh, which is the bridge between industry and academia, basically to help look at their courses and make sure their courses build industry re ready graduates. And so they asked me if I'd chair their industry advisory committee. And I'm like, yeah, love to. Sounds fantastic. I was a member of the industry advisory committee the last couple of years. And, I, you know, what a great opportunity to help, um, to help, you know, help the university really understand what matters to industry in terms of the skills of tomorrow. And then they asked me if I'd come back as a professor of practice one day a week or two days a week uh, to teach software testing and measurement at La Trobe University to third year students um, in their final year and also second year master's students. And I had, of course, to go and check with Planet because I love, love, love my job at Planet. Um, you know, of course, I had to speak with my ma our manager, Joel Deutscher, and, and our yep. manager's manager, Alex Edwards, to make sure it was okay with them. And of course, they bounced it around Planet to make sure it was acceptable because I I definitely love my job at Planet, don't want to go anywhere. Um, but I just loved the idea of going back and being able to share all that I've learned and everything that our company has learned 
with with the students of tomorrow to help build graduates who are industry ready, who know how and why quality matters to, you know, and, and how to build better quality systems. And um, so I started lecturing on Monday this week, and it was just such a fabulous experience. I really, really, really valued the opportunity to give back and to think that my knowledge is going to help another person have a better career. Because I know, I know, no matter what you're learning, if you want to be a project manager, Knowing about quality and testing will help you be a better project manager. You want to be a developer, it'll make you a better developer. It'll make you a better business analyst. Whatever your role is, you're having a better attunement to quality will help build better quality systems, which will help deliver customers better quality at the end of the day. And to think I can be paid for that as a job, you know, I mean, it's just, it's just wonderful. And so, um, yeah, I was so incredibly grateful to Planet for supporting me. Um, I ended up I'm teaching at the university one day a week and it means I am away from my desk on Mondays, but I tend to be a bit of a workaholic anyway. So kind of just taking back a bit of my personal time and plugging it into Latrobe anyway. It's not like Planet's missing out. They're still getting plenty of my time to, to deliver the, the solutions that we need for our customers. But it means I get to have the best of both worlds. You know, I get to work in industry and help solve customer problems and support our, our people at Planet. And I get to share what I've learned with with the students of, the, you know, the, the, the quality engineers of tomorrow and the project managers and the developers of tomorrow. So, you know, I feel really blessed and really, really grateful for that opportunity. It's always so inspirational to hear you talk about your passion because you absolutely love this. Let's say we've got some some listeners here. I'm just looking at the listeners now um, <laughs> that that might be keen to explore uh, going into the wonderful world of quality engineering, and they're just starting out, and they might be still trying to select what university they want to do, or maybe they're on a course in university. What kind of tips would you have for them to get down going down the path of quality engineering? Mm, excellent question. I would say if they can find a way to get into a degree in engineering, whether it's computer systems engineering or software engineering um, or even areas of civil engineering and they're moving across, engineering has an underpinning of understanding customer requirements, understanding how to design and build and develop a safe, robust system that delivers to that customer requirement, understanding how to test the system and measure the system and use tools and technologies to make the, system, the process more efficient and precise. I think engineering really brings an underpinning of quality to it. And so if you can do an engineering degree, that is a great place to start. However, even if you're not doing an engineering degree, if you're doing a computer science degree, you might be doing one at university, you might be doing one at TAFE, you may even be doing one online as a certificate for perhaps even in development. I would look for a course that gives you quality and testing as at least a subject and then pay good attention to that subject and take it seriously, put effort in to learn what the teacher and the lecturer are saying. I would also say, and I know for some people ISTQP Foundation is um, is not the be-all and end-all. That's because it was never designed as the be-all and end-all. It's one piece of the puzzle. It gives you a foundation level of understanding in concepts in quality and testing that really do matter. And in fact, at La Trobe, I'm teaching the ISTQB Foundation syllabus with extra bits added in. So Juan and, and uh, Juan Flores is also going to give a guest lecture on automation and automation engineering, automation testing. And Kadar um, Kulkani from our Melbourne team is also going to give a present a, a bit of a guest lecture on performance engineering and performance testing. So I do think ISTQB Foundation gives you an underpinning that is a really good starting point. Um, you don't have to complete a course. You can just read the syllabus, study up yourself, do online um, practice exams, which are available on the ISTQB website. The exam itself costs around, I believe, $320 Australian to complete, which hopefully is within people's reach. But even if you just learn the concepts that are in the ISTQB foundation course, you will have a good underpinning of knowledge that you can bring forward. I do think self-study is a great way to learn. I think if you can at least do a certificate for or an ISTQB foundation, um, it does give you it gives you a bit more oomph than you might otherwise get through just through self-study. But I will also say there are plenty of really really affordable training courses on Udemy, 
and other platforms, you know, you can go and sit ISTQB Foundation training on Udemy for a very, very affordable price, you know, in the tens of dollars, not the hundreds of dollars, um, and certainly not the thousands of, thousands of dollars. So I think anywhere where you can educate yourself on quality and testing, that's a great starting point. Um, if you're lucky enough to do an engineering degree, that's the ultimate um, also, Planet offers a boot camp. Uh, so there are organisations such as Planet that provide boot camps in testing and quality. Planet's boot camp takes people from all walks of life. We have had bankers and bakers and nurses and, you know, and computer science graduates, people from all walks of life coming to Planet and joining our company um, and becoming some of the best consultants and delivery people we have in fact I even remember one of my favorite people one of our most clever people who had management capacity written all over her she actually worked in a coffee shop as a coffee shop manager um, scheduling and timetabling and overseeing quality from a coffee shop perspective that underpinning of experience is fantastic experience to bring forward into the world of quality and testing because we need people who can be leaders as well as people who can be doers. Planet's Boot Camp um, usually opens a couple of times a year in different regions of Planet, and we advertise on our website. You go through a two-minute um, online interview where you have to send a recorded message to answer three key questions, usually three to five key questions. If you make it past um, the recorded interview stage, you go through, a, I think, a short five-minute interview stage. Uh, if you make it through that stage, then you come in for a couple of weeks of training, and if you pass our exam, at the end of that training, you're offered a job as an analyst at Planet, an entry-level analyst. Some of our very, very best people started through the bootcamp program, so I can highly recommend it as, a, as an opportunity to move into quality and testing. I will lastly say that a lot of our customers have, for example, people at a bank might work at a branch, and they hear a call for help from the bank, hey, we've got a new system going live. Can anyone put their hand up and offer to help with the user acceptance testing? If you work on the front end of our banking systems, can you come and help us test the new front end banking systems that we're going to be releasing soon? Getting involved in user acceptance testing is another way that our employees and our customers' employees have moved from different areas of the business into a job in testing. It's a great stepping stone great opportunity for people. Those are fantastic gems of tips there. Thank you so much, uh, Tafleen. It's been absolutely wonderful talking to you. Inspirational as always. I've said it twice already. Um, uh, thank you for your time. And to our listeners, thank you and see you next time. You're welcome. Thank you so much.